My name is Michelle Wise and I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Auckland and I'm also an obstetrician at Auckland DHB. So thank you for inviting me to speak about how to reduce interventions in childbirth. I have spent the last nine years looking at this in different ways and I thought I would cover a few different interventions. The first is induction of labor. We know that one in four women in New Zealand had an induction of labor last year and that's on the rise. Uh, the other intervention that's very common and very timely at the moment to speak about is cesarean section and we know that one in four women in New Zealand had a cesarean section last year and that's also on the rise not just in New Zealand, it's a global phenomenon. And about half of those are elective planned cesareans and the other half are emergency cesareans or unplanned in labor. So I thought I would just talk through a few ways of um, reducing both that has some evidence in the literature about how to do that effectively. So with respect to induction of labor, I think most of us know by now that if we offer a woman to sweep the membranes or a membrane sweep uh, around 38, 39, 40 weeks, it's likely to reduce her chances of needing a formal induction of labor if she goes overdue, if she goes at least one week past her due date. So that is something that we would routinely offer and we would recommend that women are routinely offered that. And um, I guess the next question is, what about the relationship between induction of labor and cesarean section? So if you look at your own data, um, most people would say, when I induce somebody, I tell her that there's an increased chance of her having a cesarean because of the induction. So that's one of the problems with, um, I guess, observational data is that there's something about the women who we induce which is different from the women who go into labor spontaneously and if you compare those two groups it will seem that if you induce somebody they will have they are more likely to have a cesarean however if you actually take the same group of women say women with high blood pressure or women um, who've ruptured their membranes for example and you compare women having an induction versus women managed expectantly, so just waiting for them to spontaneous labor, if you actually l research those two groups and compare them properly, you will always see that they either, the induction either reduces their cesarean section rate or at the very least it doesn't increase it. So we do notice this discrepancy and I guess it just takes that bit of extra time to understand that so that we can stop saying that an induction leads to a cesarean and in fact reframe how we counsel women about induction and be quite honest in that for some reasons for induction of labor it actually can reduce cesarean and the Americans have gone as, as far as saying that once you're 41 weeks, once you're one week over your due date, that actually the reason to induce at that point is not only to reduce the risk of stillbirth but also to reduce your risk of cesarean. So ironically one of my key messages today is that offering an induction of labor can actually reduce your cesarean section rate. Um, that was also found in the recent study that came out last year, also an American study where they recruited women at 39 weeks gestation and offered them an induction of labor with no medical reason. Not that I'm advocating that we do that here, but I think we can't ignore their finding, which was the significant finding that the cesarean section rate was reduced in the women who had an induction. So let's move on to cesarean section. We um, have half of our women um, having an emergency cesarean in labor and the other half having a planned cesarean section. So we have um, tried to examine in New Zealand why the cesarean rate is increasing. In my hospital, it's actually up to 40% some, some months. So it's, it's not an insignificant intervention and that's what everyone is concerned about at the moment. So if I said to the average person on the street, why do you think we're having high cesareans? They would point to that too posh to push phenomenon of women are just requesting it. The doctors just find it convenient to schedule it in at nine o'clock on a Wednesday. Um, however, we don't find that to be the case in New Zealand. There are countries where that is the case, but not here. 
Then you look at how the demographics of women are changing. So we recognize that women are becoming more overweight and there's more obesity in pregnancy. We also see women being older at the time of their first birth. And those trends are definitely um, associated. So those trends are definitely associated with cesarean section, but I don't think that's the whole picture. I think there's such variation across the different district health boards around New Zealand and variations amongst providers within one hospital that we have to look at something beyond the women themselves and that's us, that's the obstetricians and also the hospital. How is the system set up to promote normal vaginal birth? I think that's where we can find things that we can change in order to promote normal birth. So for example, does your hospital have a pathway to offer women an external cephalic version if your baby is presenting breach at term? Does your hospital have a pathway to be counseled about a vaginal birth after cesarean section if they've had a previous cesarean section? So our hospital has both of these and if it's not easy to refer and there's not clinicians who offer these procedures in a safe way, then it's not for the women to choose them, it's actually us as obstetricians or as hospitals limiting access to these and amazingly you only need to offer three women with breech presentation an ECV in order to prevent one cesarean and you only need to offer two women a VBAC in order to prevent one cesarean. So these are not high cost things that a DHB has to find budget for, these are things that we just need to be offering routinely within our day-to-day -day practice. Let's talk about unplanned cesarean section in labor, the most common cause would be failure to progress or arrest of descent or arrest of um, dilation in labor. Um, I think we see a lot of early intervention when we feel that maybe we could have waited a little bit longer. Um, the Americans are leading the way in this as well. There are recent uh, policy or guideline around labor is that uh, we certainly can safely let women um, wait longer during the first stage of labor in order to see if they will go on and have vaginal birth. So um, they're actually saying, um, I think, at least six hours of good contractions from six centimeters to get to fully dilated, which is longer than we usually let women labor. Uh, in the second stage, um, they've added an extra hour to each part of that. So for example, if you were a first time mom with an epidural, we would probably call it at three hours. The Americans are recommending four. Um, with multips, we would probably call it at two hours. They're recommending three. So there's an element of just having more patients in labor. With respect to malposition, so a lot of babies are presenting occiput posterior and that's a key reason for why the labor isn't progressing as quickly as we expect. I try to teach my registrars when I'm on call with them to learn the maneuver of taking your hand and physically moving the baby from an occiput posterior position to the normal occiput anterior position. And the best time to do that seems to be at the beginning of the pushing um, part of labor. So uh, the um, number of women with an OP position who would need to have that performed to prevent one cesarean section is four. Again, no cost to this, no budget to this. We just need a whole bunch of clinicians who are trained and skilled to be able to perform this safely and be able to offer that routinely in our day-to-day -day practice. So in summary, how do we make these changes? I think you need to find local champions who are respected in your setting in order to figure out, to prioritize which of these you would want to um, implement in your setting, see what's feasible, see what your audience, what your clinicians, your midwives want to change and figure out how to actually change something because there's a lot we can do to reduce intervention in childbirth that we can do safely and not um, put any mothers or babies at risk. Uh, so that's my message to New Zealand. Thank you.